Please welcome to Google Ann Arbor, Senior Vice President of Marketing, Tony Ambrosa. Take it away. Thank you for the, uh, the warm welcome, everyone. I mean, I do know why you really are here. We had to bring the 18s, our, our famous beanie, so uh, we're, uh, we're excited to see all of you sporting it. I live around Ann Arbor, so I'll be looking for those beanies uh, throughout town. So thank you again for coming. Um, before I kick off with the whole presentation, I have strategically placed videos in here to make sure you all stay awake. Because it is, you know, that one to two o'clock witching hour after lunch. Um, but the first one is really to bring to life, hopefully for many of you, the true spirit and essence of what we're all about. It's a recent film that we produced in partnership with Jason Momoa. So if a few of you may know who he is. Pretty famous for different roles and lead, leading parts he's uh, been able to secure. And um, we have been very fortunate to be f become close friends with him over the last three and a half years. He's directed and produced uh, four of our last commercials. And he grew up an Iowa kid, uh, you know, and, and the son of a single mom. Um, and raised by his grandfathers who were farmers and carpenters as well. So I'm going to kick things off with the film that we did in partnership with Jason that really speaks to the power of building a legacy for that next generation. You want to stay, buddy? Ben Affleck! Woo! Gal Gadot! Ray Fisher! Ezra Miller! And Jason Momoa! Ever since I was a little boy, I always wanted to be a father. But never in my life did I ever think that I would be an actor. I was raised in small town America, surrounded by hard work, cornfields, and pigs. My uncles and grandfather were the hunters and builders of the Midwest. I was raised by a strong single mother. My mom's an artist in every way. She's a painter, a photographer, she's a wanderer. Always searching, always seeing. I guess you could say my mom gave me her eyes. My mom introduced me to skateboarding and rock climbing. And I absolutely love her for that. Because skateboarding, it, it gave birth to a style for me. It wasn't just the skating, it was the music, it was the crew, the underground. Architecture was forever changed. You wouldn't believe how much fun you could have on a curb. And climbing, it made me face my fears and my doubts. Explored the impossibles, problem solved through movement. I learned to trust my hands, find my feet, and I found balance. And I found my passion. I wanted to see the world climbing. I craved the road, the wild. I wanted to get out, explore it all. Camping, fires, playing music, telling stories, living in the dirt, eating crackers and sardines. I was a dirt bag. There's not a care in the world. up my life and I put it on my back free to wander everywhere from Tibet to France Italy Japan everywhere USA my travels made me a student of life somehow that path led me to a crossroads and at the end of that road acting cornered me she seduced me for an anxious young man, it finally allowed me to be anything that I wanted to be. The wonderlust gave way to direction and purpose. I could be a barbarian or a bartender. I could be a savage cull or the king of Atlantis. 19 years I've been doing this. I'm an actor, 
I'm a director. I write and I produce. I found my path. I'm a craftsman. My craft is storytelling. And then it happened. She came. My muse, the love of my life. My partner in crime. I felt stupid, crazy, madly in love with her. My wife gave me three beautiful, feral kids. Zozo Bear, Lola Bear, my lovey, and the wolf. And with them, my dreams finally came true. So I'm a father. I found my place, my home. And like any father, we want our children to see us doing what we love. But now, my passion for storytelling pulls me away for long periods of time. And that scares me. The nomadic lifestyle that once inspired me, and now takes me away from the things that I love most. My Ohana, my family. I'm afraid of what I'm gonna miss. The laughs, the cries, being able to help them, teach them. I don't want to miss those moments. If I think about it, I only have five more years, five summers, and I'm not the center of their universe. I decided to surround my children with who I am, with music, painting, all my art forms. Because if I teach them to skate, then they can surf or snowboard. Ultimate balance, bold and brave in any terrain. And if they teach them to climb, then they can push themselves to the limits, gracefully move through fear and doubt. To learn respect for our natural resources. Because if they can admire nature's truest colors, then they can begin to see the beauty in all things. To be aware of those inconspicuous and overlooked details of life, I want to give them my eyes. They will know art. They'll paint, they'll sculpt. They'll understand light and darkness and composition to find their soul. And that's where the music lies, the soul. You teach them to play, because if they can play, they can sing. And if they can sing, then they can dance. And when you dance, you celebrate. It is all connected. These lessons will teach them expression of self. And if I build it, then I can teach them hard work, dedication, integrity, a moral code. Now every time my children play, they can feel that their papa is always with them. Since the moment I left my mother's house, to the moment that I built a home with my wife, from the ultimate highs to the lows that brought me to my knees, there has been one constant. Something that stayed with me through all of this. Like a home on the road, a comfort disguised as armor. I see it every time that I look down at these tattered old pants. It's my battlefield. From the paint to the stitches, every scratch, ding, laugh, and cry is recorded in these pants. Every mark is a memory. Every tear adds up to the life I always wanted to live. Everything I am is in these pants. And there will come a day when I'll be gone and my children or my grandchildren, they will find these beat up old cards in a dusty corner somewhere. And they will know this is the canvas of my life.
That's a story that was authentically inspired by the fact that he absolutely lives in those pants <laughs> and all the time. Um, he's wanted to tell a story about them and, for, and, it, and it morphed through the relationship we had with him into being really a story about the legacy he wants to leave for his kids. The idea that he doesn't want his kids to just know him as this you know, crazy actor and superhero. He wants to teach them you know, to, the responsibility. He wants to teach them to enjoy making and creating. He doesn't want them to grow up in this crazy Hollywood bubble you know, where they're not out of touch with reality. And the, and the coolest part of all was he gave us the opportunity and the platform to tell a story that our consumer has been sending to Carhartt for over 100 years. We have pants, bibs, coats framed on our walls with letters written by the people who say often that they had to return it to the maker because they couldn't dare to throw it away. And usually it's because the wife forced them to get rid of it <laughs> along the way as well. And, and so it was awesome to have a partner in Jason Momoa who could authentically tell this story, which is a story that our hardworking consumers have been telling for generations. And being that we're a family-run business, you know, founded by a person by the name of Hamilton Carhartt in 1889 here in Michigan. For those of you who don't know, we are local. Um, you know, it's a pretty powerful opportunity to be a part of a company that's still owned and operated by the founding family. And we still are guided by this man's principles and his vision and his beliefs. You know, that, that long before anybody ever really focused on the story behind the garment, he was telling it. Now it's commonplace, right? Everybody wants to know the deeper story. They want to see the whole story behind the brand they believe in. While he was communicating and sharing this point of view, when, for instance, child labor was a big issue in the clothing industry, he was taking a stand against it. He was making product up to a standard for people who did blue collar trades and work, who traditionally wore rags that were stitched together and sewn by wives or mothers. He said, there's got to be a better garment. There has to be a better way to make it. These people should have hard, rugged clothing that works for the job. So long before we had this cool athleisure trend where everybody's running around in you know, Nike or Under Armour or Lululemon or any other brand, he was making purpose-built product for folks that most people have ignored for decades. He cared when others didn't. And these are still the values that we live by today. A lot of these values, people are like, well, sounds like a millennial mindset study that somebody had to come up with, right? <laughs> and I just laugh about it because I'm always like, whenever I'm in those meetings, I'm like, because uh, I'm an Xer. I don't know if there are any Xers in here. Probably most folks are millennials. Oh, a few. Thank you. It's good to see a few Xers because we're the forgotten generation, right? Or the skipped over one. You know, you got the big boomers and the big millennials. Um, but uh, I always am like, I'm kind of like mad. Like they are like, well, you know, millennials, they love authentic brands. I'm like, did Xers, were we like all about fake ones? <laughs> you know, like, like why is this so, like, why is this such a big insight? I don't get it. But this is our founder, Hamilton Carhartt. You know, and, and we still see it now today. I mean, these are pictures people send to us. I have had the great pleasure to learn and work with really smart people at big brands that a lot of people really want to talk about all the time on the news. I didn't get things like this. Never. Hardly. I mean, never. I can guarantee it. And when their sneakers wore out or their base layer started to get stinky, like everybody knows that polyester stuff can do, right? They didn't mail it back to us unless they wanted a replacement. You know? And that's what we have here, which is incredible. You know, and building off of what you just saw, you know, from Jason Momoa, I mean, this is one of, the, one of the letters. I always like to bring this one out because those overalls, I mean, this is one stingy farmer, but if you, any of you ever grew up in a farming family, you recognize the value of money and their ability to make something last. And the, and the simple, if you can't read the, the fine print, the simple story here is these bibs outlived his wife, who mended them for years. They outlived his neighbor, who decided to start mending them for him. So he finally was like, well, I, I guess I got to send him back and get some new ones finally, you know? But it's, it's just that incredible relationship that happens with people and, and the product that they wear because of all the things they do in it. And this has guided us on a mission that, that really 
is still a continuation of our, our, our founder, Hamilton, with uh, Mark Vallade, who's the, the fourth generation family member and CEO um, still today. Um, and that is, we exist to create and build enduring products to serve and protect hardworking people. Now, probably a few people, though, have, have like uh, Simon Sinek readers or viewers or, you know, protagonists, antagonists, I'm sure, somewhere along the line. Um, but if you think about it, you know, it is, it is rooted in a simple why for Carhartt that was started with Hamilton, which is the belief in hard work. Hamilton Carhartt had a quote, and I, I have to read it from my, my notes here. Work is the thing, good, earnest, honest, hard work in the right direction, everlastingly, persistently, continuously work. Making good is merely a matter of exerting sufficient energy. Certainly the pros of the day were a little different than what we have today, but the simple fact is this, he appreciated hard work, and that's what we still do today. And, and it doesn't have to be in the form of somebody swinging a giant pickaxe or sledgehammer for us to appreciate it as well. We appreciate the hard work of a Jason Momoa and the lifestyle he leads. And that's who we invite into this brand for the values we stand for. So I often hear how this brand is being embraced by folks who typically wouldn't be seen wearing it over the last five or six years. That's great. That's really good. But we're not changing our values. And we're not changing who we are all about. But we're certainly willing to open up the umbrella as we share the story of what CAR stands for. Now, now why, why, uh, why has all this happened? I mean, some folks have asked over the last few years, you know, you start to see car more and more. Well, some of it is we have great partners like Downtown Home and Garden who sold a beautiful dog chore coat down there that's proudly being worn. You know, it's nice to have partners, you know, because your retailers are a big part of this story. Um, when I had the opportunity to come back home, I grew up in the Midwest. I, I grew up in Ohio, two hours away. A uh, big fan of the Lions, the Tigers, and the Red Wings. And, uh, you know, my grandfathers were blue collar. They worked in uh, industry, machine shops. They wore bibs. They had the metal lunch pails. I'll never forget that. My parents were there, the first generation in their family to actually get a college degree. And like most families of the day, they went into teaching because that was really the profession that they knew to pursue um, afterwards. And, and I grew up with this. I did construction jobs. And so the opportunity to be a part of a brand like this was amazing. But first, the first thing we did was we were like, we have to spend time with our consumer. Who are these people? What makes them special? Because I went from having an opportunity to sell something that more people seem to want to fight about outside of politics, but I'm not touching that now. <laughs> yeah. And that is your favorite sports team, right? Living in Ann Arbor, there's a lot of conversation around that at the college level. Right? If you're in Europe, try arguing over your favorite football club or soccer club, as you may know. Right? There are families that are divided and never talk to each other again because of these feuds. Right? That's a passion. For work, that's a four-letter word that most people are happy to forget about the moment they're done with it. Right? So it's hard to market and inspire through that unless you really understand why they do it. You know, and that's what we found was, wow, they have stories to tell. They have a lot of stories to tell, really interesting ones. Um, and what we started to learn more and more is they believe in this notion that by working, you earn the ability to build a better life. They believe that making something with your hands is far greater than sitting in a room like I'm sitting in today because what I get to say I made today was a really neat keynote presentation that hopefully <laughs> kept you awake for an hour. Right? So that's what, I t that's what I'll tell my kids today when, we, you know, when I see them this evening. What did you do today, Dad? Well, that's what I did today. What they value is the ability to say at the end of their day, they made something, or they made many things, or they built a building. And that building will forever be something they can identify with. And we heard that over and over again. They like to make beer. Thank God they do. I love craft beer, and I love being in Michigan. You know? But that's somebody who's a maker. You know? And we appreciate those folks. You know, and we recognized something early on, too. They said something that, that I immediately just kind of jumped out of my seat when I heard it. They think with their hands. So in a company like Google, it's interesting to share that perspective, right? Because some of the brightest minds on the planet all work at Google. I hear about it from my friends. I went to college in New York City. Investment banks were scooping up all the minds then. Now my buddy who's a partner at B of A says, yeah, Google takes all the best ones now. You know? And it's true. But imagine, though, how good are your hands? Mine aren't that good. <laughs> my hands can't 
really make very much. They know how to type. <laughs> you know, they're pretty good at that. My wife will remind you all the jobs that I try to take on at home and how poorly I do with those. And then I give up and I hire somebody who actually knows how to think with their hands. But it's an appreciation for that fact. You know, and that's a powerful appreciation. You know, and, and we spend a lot of time with them. We have a team right now who's been on the road, God bless them, for over 25 days, shooting and capturing film and photography and story after story that we're going to bring to life this fall in holiday. They were just in the Upper Peninsula with Outside Magazine. Because what we found is, if you're a brand that actually tells really interesting stories, you don't have to pay to tell them. That was the whole Jason Momoa film. We're over 70 million impressions and growing, and that eight and a half minute film, which blew away all the rules, but let me tell you, he was not gonna change it. <laughs> you can negotiate with Cal Drago all you want. <laughs> we did, <laughs> right? And, and the view, view rate is crazy. Full view rate is crazy. And you guys I know can run all the stats on YouTube, but we ran it across all platforms too. But you would see it's breaking rules. When you have an interesting, real, meaningful story, people wanna cover it. Editors wanna write about it. So we're up there with Outside Magazine in the UP telling stories about some of the, the ski lodge, you know, ski um, mountains um, up in that, what is it, the horn of the UP. Pretty amazing, you know, when you can do that. But it's how you break through because we don't have a Ford Motor Company budget when it comes to advertising, right? So our goal is we need to tell stories that are actually interesting and inspiring. Not that they don't but we really have to break through. So we spend a lot of time with them. We start to understand their personas. And we've understood one thing loud and clear, you know, that the car isn't just an outdoor outerwear brand that you wear when it's cold. It epitomizes an outdoor orientation towards life that's year round. They don't just go outside. We don't just go outside when it's cold out with Carhartt. We go outside all year long. And it's not just for men, contrary to popular belief. But we have a long way to go, because we have 100 and some years of being for men, even though through the years we outfitted Rosie the Riveter, lo and behold. Um, and we've done things with women um, historically. We've had a women's line now for about, I've got a few folks here from work, 10 years, Lindy? 2007. 2007, so 10 years, 10 years. And we're gonna be celebrating women in a slightly bigger way this year. We've got a few interesting stories we wanna tell. And we're going to bring those to life because we always hear after every video or commercial we run or piece of uh, advertising, you know, from a lot of women who say, hey, I'm a welder. Why won't you tell my story? You know, I work just as hard. And I do a better job. <laughs> <laughs> and we're like, we're not here to say you don't. <laughs> Our problem is, first and foremost, with women's product, um, it's not readily available outside of a few destinations online and a few stores in brick and mortar. So thank God for Google because you can help them find us now. You know, and that's one of the big opportunities. You know, a lot of us, a lot of people keep saying too, what are you doing around the millennial, millennial, millennial? It's like, I, what are we doing? We're just being who we are. And we're celebrating craft and making and doing, which just happens to coincide with what that mindset cares about. You know, and that's, that's what we're doing. But we're being who we are. We're not trying to be a different company, you know, um, by any stretch. We also have a fantastically growing opportunity with the Hispanic consumer and their growing presence in America and how that's changing the face of hard work. We're not here to be exclusive. Hard work is hard work. And that's what we're for, no matter what the rules of engagement are. And, and that's something that we are spending more and more time better understanding and building upon as well. But we also know it can't be just about work all the time. If there's one thing that we like to joke about is beer, barbecues, beef, and buddies. The four Bs, the post-work activities. And, and really capturing that in their lives, right? So, so we spend a lot of time and, and we've got personas. You know, we, we can sit down with your team, but I know your team has them. You know, we have four personas that we really focus on and build around. And those are the four we think about all the time. You know, so again, because like our, our founder, we believe in the legacy of hard work. And, and really, you know, we're embracing this 
to get people to recognize that we're not just for the person who swings the sledgehammer. So all of you are going to have a nice A18. You know? But the idea here is you shouldn't feel, ah, well, I'm not really, like, I'm not, I'm not the car guy or girl. Well, you can be. It depends on your mindset. So quite honestly, it really does. You know, and, and that's what we're shifting a little bit. You know, not just that brand that makes workwear. It's the brand that stands for hard work and hardworking people, right? It's a little shift, not a big one. You know, and, and then how do you make work interesting and cool and fun? We go to really interesting places, rugged corners of the earth, we call them, where the folks rely on car to get the job done and sometimes survive. Makes work a little more heroic, more interesting. But we also spend a lot of time with them camping, fishing, and hiking, and hunting. Because we know that that is an absolute passion place for them throughout the year. But when we think about these activities, like hunting, for instance, it's not about, you know, a lot of people, it's like the trophy on the wall. That's not what we hear all the time. It's not it, not it at all. It's the time you get to spend with family and friends and the traditions that are created. And that's what makes it so meaningful. And that's what makes it exciting for folks. And, and who really understand that, again, it's not about the trophy. It's about the experience. And, again, and, and there's another buzzword. We're the experience economy, right? And everyone's spending money on the experiences. You know, you see all of these. It's like ding, 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 you know, business buzzword bingo. You know, but in the end, we're experience-based brand because our product is purpose-built for people who do things. They don't sit on couches and watch the Discovery Channel to dream about a lifestyle. They live that lifestyle. And I guess the goal is, how can we inspire others to do the same? You may be a weekend warrior now. Great, pick up, pick up a hobby. Pick up a craft. That would be success for us if we're able to do that as a brand. All right? And because we know, too, that you know, sometimes the best meals aren't in a restaurant. Get outside. Enjoy it. This is actually a guy from, he's the uh, chef and owner of the Grange Restaurant, if you know Brandon here locally. Great guy, great partner, farm to table. We love to work with him on a lot of things. We do a lot of things locally with friends and, you know, that we've built up and developed relationships with through work and gotten to know. So how do we outwork them all? Um, you know, in a simple sense, we start with you've got to have empathy for one, one key area. You have to remember, typical household income of that core demographic, not the broader sense, but the core, is about fifty-five dollars to $60,000. So credit card limits, 1000 maybe two. So one of the things that we focus on, because I'm responsible for our direct-to-consumer business too, um, my gosh, if they have a return, they need that return credited quickly. A $150 order is a lot, and it matters, and they value it. You know? They value those dollars. To get them to spend $150 on Carhartt traditionally ends up being a Christmas purchase or a birthday purchase or something else significant, right? You have to empathize with that. You have to remember that farmer we talked about and the frugality of it, you know, and really, really understand then that if they're going to do it, you live up to it and you deliver on that promise. And if we fail for some reason with our product, we always, always take it back and we always make them good, good on that promise. We absolutely believe in inspiring a way of life. It's what we live for. That's what, one of the things that makes this job so awesome is because we can do that. And we have an owner who believes in that way of life. His family's believed in it since the founder. You know, and, and we look at it through their passions and live it through their passions. All the time with emotional, authentic, original stories. And people always go, well, why? Well, there's a part of your brain that causes people to love people. It also causes you to love that dog and love brands. And the best brands get that. You can't explain that, though, with a spreadsheet sometimes in meetings, outside of some studies that talk about people and their connectedness or their love of brand. So you can do that. And what they found through the years is that that has the closest correlation to revenue over loyalty. Your love of a brand has a higher correlation to revenue than loyalty. And it means something. And it's important in this day and age. And so that's one of the reasons we really focus on that, because we also want to be top of mind. How do I remain top of mind? Because I've seen all your stats. It drives me nuts. 
Most Google searches don't start with a brand in mind. It's like, oh, God. So they just do coats? That's horrible. You know? I want you to do car coats. You know? Because if you look at coats, you might see a better deal from somebody else. Right? But that happens. So you have to be emotionally engaged and connected. And we have to broaden our reach in order to do that. Okay? So build trust and loyalty. These are our three newest consumer profiles we've identified to date. Chris, who's that millennial mindset? Working in, the, working in the trades, typically learning their way through. Samantha, more of an Xer on the female end of the spectrum. And then David Garcia, Hispanic profile. English speaking, second generation, you know, living basically an all-American style of life, but certainly very, very tied to the traditions of where he and his family come from. You know, so those are the three new ones. And we have a Mike consumer that we identify with, and he's the traditional over 45 guy that most people recognize with Carhartt, All right? So along the way, we're not saying we're ignoring him by any stretch. He's the most loyal, spending the most right now because he has the most money to spend. Um, but what we are saying is, as we shift our, our, shift our messaging in reach and target, we're going after these folks first and foremost. Mike continues to overhear it, and he's not seeing anything with this brand that would freak him out and tell him, wait a minute, what happened to my car? Um, you guys really help us with this. Um, we have a saying, you know, are we doing everything possible to make it easy for hardworking people to choose Carhartt? So that's what guides our actions. That's what guides our effort. And our goal is to do that all year long. We have a big challenge, though. We do not sell our product to the, in the number one places they like to shop outside of one, which is a competitor of yours, Amazon, slightly. That is the only place we are that is a dominant des destination for shoppers today. And they're just building apparel as a destination choice for them, right? We're not in Walmart. We're not in Target. We're not in Kohl's. We're not in JCPenney and Sears, thank God. <laughs> um, hope nobody, you know. You can delete that later. Um, but we're not in these places where the bulk of all clothing is bought. All the studies tell us that. Those are purposeful choices that we make, not because we want to make our life difficult for the consumer, but because of the way we believe in running our business and running the brand. And they just don't match up with our beliefs today. Right? So what that means is we're not always easy and accessible. And in a convenience-driven world, I was just saying this the other day, um, and, I, and I mentioned it at lunch. We are in an age of brands because retailers are going through an incredibly difficult time. For those of you working with retailers right now, they are really challenged. If you have not invested in the web, it's too late. And you probably don't have the capital to do it because it's all sunk in a bunch of stores that are underperforming, and so you have to figure out how to get out of those stores. And, 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 and we've had meetings with some retailers who will go unnamed who are very long-standing partners of ours who have been like, you know this internet thing? I just still can't figure it out. And literally, that's what's come out of their mouth. And you just look at them and you go, oh, God. You know, like, I don't know what to tell you other than you are not on the radar of the next generation. You may have your current, but the next generation doesn't even know you exist, right? Because you're not a part of that journey. And unfortunately, it's too many retailers. And they don't even know where to start. So if there's ever an opportunity for business for you guys, it's figuring that out for them because they can't do it. They flat out can't. And we need them to, by and large. Um, because ultimately, it will define how many square feet per person we have from a retail perspective. And whether or not the 20, I think we're at like 20, and the, and, and the UK and Europe is at like 5. So we 4x every other country when it comes to how much retail we have dedicated per person. We've over-retailed this country, so it's going to decline. But we would still like there to be some retail stores around, please. 70% um, of people still say they'd rather buy clothing in a store because they'd like to try it on. They'd like to feel it. They'd like to make sure that fit is what it says it is. They don't want to deal with the hassle of returns. Number one complaint still with our consumer, what a nightmare. And what's odd is, rather than return it to us, a lot of them say they'd rather just sell it on Craigslist or on eBay. And I'm like, you still have to ship it. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But that's what they say. I don't know why. So, you know, that's, our, that's one of our key areas of focus. Um, because we really believe in this idea that we are out of the disruptor phase of marketing. 
It is not about disrupting. It's about enabling. How are we enabling and empowering that path that, to purchase? And again, you guys play a big, big part in this. And that's, that's the focus all the time as a team, over and over again. How do we break down? Because it's a challenge inside our walls. We got too many silos every single day within marketing and other worlds. It's like, guys, this is not about us. This is about them. And we are in service to their journey. We're in service to their ability to choose us because that's what's gonna keep the lights on and keep the legacy alive for the fifth generation of Carhartt that's already in the business learning the business today. We have all three kids working in the business right now, which is awesome. And we're always measuring and we're always learning and we're always looking at it again and again and say, how can we get better? What else can we get out, out of their way? What else is getting in the blocking them for making the right choice? All right, and you guys, again, provide a lot of great metrics um, on this. Traditionally, I've always enjoyed, and I'm just gonna make one plug. I haven't seen the, like, the Q4 results. Are those in yet? Because I always love like, the Q4 graph that shows search and how we did and what's going on, because that gives us an idea. What? Stay tuned. Beautiful. <laughs> um, so we're always measuring. So another video to kind of wrap this all up for you guys here, and then I've got just a quick breakdown of how we look at things from a media perspective as well. just to let you know what we're up to, we're going to continue a story we started last year, which is celebrating the future through our heritage and our founder and his guiding principles. We're at a long time. We've been making new products, introducing a lot more products. We're overcoming the stigma that used to be that a new product from Cart was a new color. So no, we're launching a lot of new products because we really want to be year-round relevant. And we're committed and dedicated to, to making that happen um, so that folks just don't reach for their Carhartt when it's mercury drops. We want to be that year-round brand. And I'm, not, I'm just showing this to say, and we are dedicated from a brand calendar. We are co constantly executing content, storytelling, and messaging to be relevant and top of mind as often as our dollar will allow us to be across multiple channels, all right? And, and we break it down in three ways. Um, and we do this because my paid bucket is not big enough to do it any other way, right? My owned and earned are just as important to us as are paid. And, and so that's how we think about things because I cannot beat the competition by just outspending the competition. And really the team is really focused on this. So in the own bucket, just a few examples, our website, we look at this as the front door to the brand. And we have a lot of work to do still, but we've made tremendous progress over the last three years. You know, I see the doggone Google speed analysis you send to us, I know it. We're meeting with our agencies. We want to make it faster for mobile. We know for 3G, it's too slow. So we get it. You know, I just got it. Like my CIO, though, says we just need an app. I'm like, OK, we need an app. But what about for all the other people who don't want to have the app, right? So we're working on it. Um, we launched a store, a flagship store in Detroit. Everyone said, what on earth were you doing putting a store in Midtown? We look kind of smart now, thank god. Um, I mean, it's doing really, really well. 
and we have a nice billboard there on the side, and it does a great job of letting people know that we're there in Detroit, and a lot of pride, and it's been in a lot of videos really commemorating the pride and return of Detroit, and that's the interior as you walk in. You know, we view that as owned, though. Every person who walks in the retail stores we own and operate is having a Carhartt experience we directly deliver. That is a powerful owned opportunity just from a marketing standpoint, let alone a selling standpoint. If we leave them with a great experience of the brand and the types of people that work there, that's a win. Now granted, we'd like them to buy stuff too because we need to pay the bills, but every person who walks through gets a better sense of who we are. They recognize that we're not just brown duck bibs and coats. They're like, oh my God, we hear it all the time. Wow, this is Carhartt? You make all this stuff? And we're like, yeah, we do. Men's Journal, and, and really what we're looking at, I think I skipped a slide, yeah. Well, here, I'm gonna skip forward. Earned, here we go. I'll go back and forth. Um, we launched a beer to celebrate our 125th with New Holland on the west side of the state. Men's Journal said, that's a really cool idea. We'd like to cover it. So we did a tour all the way to the Great American Beer Festival in Denver, and we had a pint with consumers in every town along the way and brought their stories to life. And this was really it's just a celebration. Hey, what do you do when you celebrate? You drink a beer. You raise a toast. Well, that's, that's what this was meant to do, and it led to tons and tons of earned media and impressions and storytelling. I heard, there's, I heard there's a sneaker head in here, maybe one or two. We did this in collaboration with Eminem and Brand Jordan. Why did we do it? Well, first and foremost, we did it to raise funds for the Versus Project that's run by Michigan State in inner city Detroit. 100% dedicated to one thing, which is what Eminem talked about that he cares the most about, which is the reason he's where he is today is because he actually went back to school and he learned how to read and write. If he couldn't read and write, he wouldn't be who he is today. And unfortunately, the illiteracy rate in Detroit is astoundingly high. And if you can't read and write, you can't even get a, you can't get a trades job, which is what we're focused on too. So this, we raised crazy amount of money, auctioning off 10 pairs. And it's still one of the most sought after sneakers right now. Uh, the Jordan brand, we stay in touch with them. They're getting calls all the time from famous people who are dying to get them. And, and it just continues to live on. But the purpose was, first and foremost, to do a good thing in our backyard. And it allowed us to do it, and crazy amounts of coverage. Another backyard partner, Chevy Trucks, came to us and said, you know, I don't, we, we're like, we don't know why we didn't do this like 25 years ago, but it'd make a lot of sense for us to do a, a truck with you guys and make it the ultimate work truck. So this was a showcase truck. It was at the auto show in Detroit, it was in LA. It was at a couple of other big shows, and it's been a really, really, really well-received concept and idea. So we're gonna to continue to talk with one another and see if that we can actually figure out if this makes sense for a production run as well, to make the ultimate work truck. You guys saw this on the earned side, again. You know, collaborations and partnerships to tell meaningful stories. We're also very active in movies. We love it. This jacket, the year this movie came out, Sold it out. Sold it out in the U.S. and in Europe. <laughs> Swear to God. That jacket. That jacket hadn't moved beyond its normal trajectory for decades. This movie comes out, bam. It's unbelievable. Just won an Oscar for Manchester by the Sea. Again, wearing our jacket throughout that film. And then we have a superhero now. Our first superhero. Everyone know who this is? Luke Cage. Do you know what happened when this show debuted on Netflix? You guys had to laugh about this, given who you are. It crashed Netflix. When this show debuted, it crashed Netflix. We're super excited about the next season. I guess they're pulling them all together in some other cast. I forget what it's, my son would tell me what it is. Um, but, uh, but he's going to be wearing our new coat, which is called Full Swing. And he continues to wear the car brand. And then on the paid front, I had to put a plug in for you guys. <laughs> this is from this morning. Thankfully, Emily, we're at the top. That was good. And I did not click on the ad. I never do. And it, please don't. Um, <laughs> I know you guys want us to, but I don't. I always tell people at work, don't click on the top one. Go down to the one that's free. Sorry. We have enough people that are clicking on the top one. It's working really well. Um, 
But this is, this is such a discovery mode. And for us, this is one of those signals that we love to look at to see how people are reacting to our work. We see that people will start searching us more aggressively if our work is really resonating. And let me tell you, I've got a lot of right brain. I've got just enough left brain to survive. But there are a lot of left brainers who want to see numbers when we do stuff and go, well, what did it do? And I love it when you guys can give us that kind of information. Like, oh my god, look at all the search. People, like, this happened and like within a week or so, it's powerful. So thank you. Um, retail, I talked about where we are. This is where we are, for example, field and stream is a Dick Sporting Goods concept in the outdoor industry. You know, our focus, I look at this as paid. And, and the reason I do is, see all that beautiful imagery? And this is first in Maine. This is right when you walk in their store. That's a billboard at the point of decision. So I look at those as one of the most valuable spends we can make. Because I'm putting front and center at that point of decision, that mo zero moment of truth I think you guys coined a while ago. You know, this is Boot Barn. Have you ever heard of a Boot Barn? Anyone? Anyone? Oh my god, somebody has. But they are now publicly traded and they're chasing the Western fashion trend all over the country as well, out of Southern California, believe it or not, not Texas, um, and they are growing rapidly. Um, tractor Supply, anyone know Tractor Supply? Yeah. Oh, yeah, there we go. So before I worked at Carhartt, I thought Tractor Supply was where tractor supplies were sold, <laughs> I think. And they still have to overcome that name. And they are an invaluable partner, a great partner, 12 or uh, 1,500 doors I think they're up to now. You know, and, and we're bringing our brand to life with them in new ways, which is awesome. Orchard Supply, a hardware store on the West Coast owned by Lowe's. They are beautiful. I think of, you'd compare them to Downtown Home and Garden if you recognize uh, that, that local retailer here as well. And then this is just an, an example of how crazy it can be with our mom and pops, and this is why they're important to us. This is a Hartville Hardware, it's in central Ohio. We have somewhere in the neighborhood of like 10,000 square feet which is bigger than some of our retail stores. We do millions of dollars to this one hardware store. We really need them to figure out the internet. <laughs> you know? Again, if that's how important it can be for us as we think about this. And then the trips to those stores have led to this chain in Europe. So in Ireland, <laughs> there's a hardware chain called Woody's. And we are scaling shops all over Ireland um, with, uh, with this hardware chain, where our brand is, is really new in the workwear space. So, that is Carhartt. So thank you for staying through it all. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. That was, uh, that was awesome. Um, I know just being in, in Michigan and uh, personally living just outside of Detroit, uh, Carhartt's been one of those brands that really in the last, like, call it like five to six years is kind of come into the, uh, the, the, the millennial zeitgeist, which uh, mm. is kind of a benefit. But to hear you talk about the authenticity that, you know, it's like you're not necessarily trying to do that. It just works out because you're authentic without having to try. Usually, uh, you're, usually you're only authentic when you're not trying. Yeah. You know? Yeah, that's when a, that's you a good way to put it. Yeah. But uh, no, it's, uh, we have an amazing story to tell. We just needed yeah. to uh, tell it, quite honestly. And that's, that's, that's what we're all focused on. Yeah, and so, and, and you touched on this uh, a little bit, but the decision to put the, mm -hmm. the store in Midtown Detroit, yeah. can you tell me a little bit about it? It sounds like maybe there was a, there's a backstory of some uh, debate. Well, there was definitely debate. I mean, you got a lot of Detroiters, proud Detroiters yeah. in the office, yeah. okay? People have been there far longer than I. Yeah. And, and Jamin Millar, who runs our retail division, you know, has been with us now for, I think, five years, and he's been with great retail brands throughout his career. You know, he found this space, and he really had the vision for it. And, uh, you know, he championed it inside the halls because Midtown, what was it, three-plus years ago when we signed the lease? Somewhere in that neighborhood. Midtown was still kind of, you know, yeah. emerging. And, yeah. and now, I mean, we're seeing more and more retail brands pop up all around us. Yeah. So it's been exciting. We couldn't believe how people really turned out for it, too. It's doing really well. Yeah. Far exceeding expectations. No, that's great. Uh, my children destroyed it this weekend, awesome. so sorry about Thank that. You. Uh, no, no. Um, so I, I, I want to talk a little bit about uh, your career path. It's been sure. very cool. I mean, there's a lot of people in here that work with all different types of clients, um, mm -hmm. but I, I personally work with a lot of retailers in, in cool. the apparel space. So um, can you take us through just kind of your, your career? I mean, we, we covered it a little bit, but I'd love to hear about the path that led you to, to Carhartt. 
Uh, sure. I mean, I'll, I'll try to be brief. Um, <laughs> it can be pretty boring really quickly. You know, I, uh, I just knew that I wanted to be a part of uh, things that people were passionate about. Um, I wanted to work in the marketing space. I was an econ poli sci double major. Most people in my space didn't go into marketing. They went into investment banking or law. Yeah. And uh, I just knew I wanted to be in a space that people really cared about. Um, my worst nightmare was trying to convince people to buy a brand or a product that you really didn't care about. And I've always used the example not to be, you know, not to be negative on the people who do that, but like I would never want to be like the head of like a toilet paper brand. You know, or, or something like that. Like, I wanted to be something, I always said I wanted to be something that people were passionate about. And, 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 the, and the, really the key insight for me was, and still is, I mean, I'm, I'm really passionate about things that are related to the life I grew up with. And I grew up very connected to sport and very connected to a blue collar way of life. And, and that's where, that's really led my path. And I had a really great person, Alan Rosenshein. Um, who was a, an alum of the university college I went to as an undergrad, basically gave me that advice um, while I was trying to figure out what in the heck I wanted to do. And he said, just follow your heart, follow your passion. And uh, that's what I've done every step of the way. And I've had a chance to work for a sports agency representing uh, Bulls players when they made their second run of three. I worked for Planet Hollywood when everyone said that that was going to be the next concept of experience. And uh, then I went to Nike and Under Armour. And, and what I found every step of the way is uh, it's a heck of a lot of fun when you work for you know, brands people care a great deal about. Yeah. You know, and, and that's what I have with Carhartt as well. Very so. cool. So uh, Nike, Under Armour, going, you know, been to a lot of, a lot of big cities. Uh, and yep. then uh, obviously you're in proximity to your, your hometown, but yes. you wind up in, in Dearborn, in Carhartt in Detroit. Yeah. Um, how, have you found, how have you found the fair cities? Oh, great. I mean, really, uh, yeah. You know, it's funny, yeah, I, I, I saw that. So when I moved to Portland in 99, Portland was not the Portland you see today. It's unbelievable how that has changed. It was pretty rough and rugged. I lived off of Burnside and it was, uh, you, know, you know, just a really, really kind of, it was turning, but it was far from turning. You know, the Pearl District, anybody been there? You know where the Pearl District is today? It's basically taken over Portland. Anyway, so Portland now is the shining star example of a city reborn. And uh, Baltimore was doing the same thing. And then I, I moved here, and now Detroit. I mean, when I moved here, I'll never forget buying a place in Ann Arbor. And the loan, the person we were getting the loan from at the bank was like, everyone else is leaving. Why are you moving in? Yeah. You know? And I looked, and I go, well, my wife's right here. Thanks a lot, buddy. Yeah. I mean, you know? But I mean, it was just that time. You know? It was like there was a lot of like unsettled um, feelings. And now you walk around, and there's confidence, there's pride, there's belief. Um, you know, and, and there should be. Yeah. It's a great place to live. That's Michigan awesome. is one of the, you know, the best kept sec secrets, I say. If, the, if it had a mountain, we'd be overpopulated because of the Great Lakes. If we had a mountain to go with those Great Lakes, it'd be over. That'd be over. That's fair. So, so what you're saying is basically the next city you move to, we should start investing <laughs> yeah. in because that's yeah. the pattern. Got it. There you go. Um, so we are, uh, we are almost out of time. I've got one last question sure. here. I know there's a lot of uh, folks in the audience uh, that, as we mentioned, kind of like looked at your career path, and mm -hmm. it's, it's very impressive. If you had one piece of advice to somebody aspiring to, to uh, follow a similar, similar path to sure. yourself. Um, well, like I said at the beginning, follow your passion because it'll never be work, um, and it hasn't. And uh, the number two thing really is, you know, find people, whether you work for them or not, who you can really, really learn from. And uh, spend as much time as you can soaking up as much as you can from those folks. Because I've had the great, great fortune of having some incredibly smart mentors yeah. uh, from the companies where I've worked who've taught me a ton. And uh, I definitely wouldn't be sitting here right now talking to you guys this way if it weren't for them. And uh, those are really the two difference makers for me you know, along the way. Lastly, I shouldn't leave her out. My wife has played a pretty big role in this too. <laughs> so an incredible partner in crime and being willing to move the way we have. Yeah, it's funny so. how that, that happens. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, very so cool. You. Yeah, thank you very much, Tony. I appreciate it. Uh, big round of applause for Tony Ambrosa. Thank you. All right. Um,